Hello everyone, I'm Katherine Kuchenbecker, like she said, I'm an engineering professor at the University of Pennsylvania and I'm honored to be here today to tell you a little bit about my research, but I want to start first with a story, something that happened to me in sixth grade. My school, where I went to school, had these great monkey bars and my friends and I liked to play on these monkey bars, not just going across them forward or every other bar or backwards, but also flipping up on top of them and doing all sorts of creative tricks. And so one day during lunch, I was trying to design a new trick where you would swing around, 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 and unfortunately, I landed badly. And I twisted my knee. And that got me a ride in the ambulance to go see a doctor. And that doctor, Dr. Earhart, told me I'd hurt my knee pretty badly. And I had to wear a no mobilizing knee brace, like you see, and use crutches for quite a while and go to physical therapy to get strong enough to do the things that people do every day, like walk around. And I'm lucky I was able to get better from this knee injury in sixth grade. I started at a new school in seventh grade for middle school and, and high school called Brentwood. And it was there that I learned to play volleyball. I love volleyball. I grew up in Southern California. It's a great sport for young women. Uh, and I loved it so much and I played so much that I was even able to play in college. So I went to Stanford University, which is in Northern California, and I played there on the varsity volleyball team. I was a walk-on, which meant I didn't have a scholarship for sports. Most of the other players did, um, but I was, the coaches decided I was good enough to get to play on this amazing team. And we actually won the NC2A championship my freshman and sophomore year, which was super cool. But you remember that knee, right? So since sixth grade, I'd had this knee problem and unfortunately one day I was playing on that court that you see there and again I was jumping and I landed wrong and I had to wear a knee brace again I hurt my knee again I had to be on crutches again and this time when I went to see the doctor they said Catherine you're not gonna be able to just do physical therapy you need knee surgery now I hope no one ever tells you you need surgery but it's possible uh, many many people do end up getting surgery in their lives um, but the kind of surgery that my doctor told me I needed was a special kind called arthroscopic. Arthro means having to do with a joint, like your knee, and scopic is with a camera, a scope that they use to look inside your body. Uh, so it's a minimally invasive type of surgery that they can do. Um, and so this is what it looks like. Uh, they basically make two tiny incisions in your knee and then they can put into one a camera on a stick and in the other, a tool, and they can fix your knee. And that's what they did for me. Here's a photo of my knee from just a couple days ago. And you can hardly even see the scars. There they are. They kind of look like two eyes. Uh, there are two tiny scars, and my knee has been a lot better ever since I had that surgery. And this was a stressful thing to go through, uh, but it let me still be able to keep playing volleyball at Stanford, uh, where I was studying mechanical engineering. Um, but if you look back on this, I was actually pretty lucky, because the kind of surgery that I needed the surgeons could do with these handheld, minimally invasive tools, kind of like chopsticks, but with a gripper. So long, thin tools that they could insert through those tiny incisions, and the surgery was simple enough that they could do it. This is what an operating room looks like when they're doing um, minimally invasive surgery. They're looking at the camera, it's almost like watching TV, uh, and then they're reaching around inside the patient and fixing the body, the body part that they're operating on. Unfortunately, a lot of other kinds of surgery can't be done with minimally invasive tools. Instead, you have to have a big incision. Sorry, it's gross, but this is what real surgery looks like. Because the doctor has to be able to see inside your body and touch it and cut it and put it back together. And that leaves you with a big scar. And not only is the scar afterwards something you might be um, embarrassed of or you might have these extra marks on your body, having to cut through healthy tissue, like the healthy stuff on the top of your body, hurts a lot. And it makes it more likely for you to get an infection in the cut. And it also um, makes it so that some people who are already older or a little uh, more frail can't have surgery that they need because they can't um, withstand such big incisions. And so having been a patient myself, and also because my dad is a surgeon, I've always been really interested in trying to improve technology like this so that we can make it so more surgeries can be done without having to have these big incisions. Uh, and in 1999, this company called Intuitive Surgical, or actually a professor that I worked with at Stanford, was one of the first engineers at this company, they developed a new robotic surgical system called 
the Da Vinci. And here's a photo of what a Da Vinci robot looks like. Um, instead of having the surgeon hold the tools in their hand, a robot holds the tools. Over on the right-hand side, you can see where the patient would lay. There's a camera that looks inside the patient and these robot, long, thin robotic instruments. And the surgeon remotely controls the tools from across the room um, to do the surgery. And what's great about it is those instruments have wrists. So not just a gripper on a stick, they can now do um, pretty tricky things. Uh, and those grippers, if we zoom in on them, they're tiny. They're as big as the eraser on the end of a pencil. And the surgeon can control them in a very natural way. Many uh, surgeries, complicated surgeries, are now done with robots like this. Penn has six or seven da Vinci robots, and they get used for all sorts of different operations, mostly in your abdomen or your pelvis or your thorax. I hope, I super hope you don't ever have to have surgery, but if you do, it's a pretty cool option to have it done by a robotic surgical system. So, um, because then you will just have tiny scars like that instead of big scars, and you'll also get to go home much faster. So I am an engineering professor, a mechanical engineer at the University of Pennsylvania. I've been a professor for seven years. And one of the things I've worked on a lot in my career um, has been trying to improve technology like this. Engineers can simultaneously say, wow, that is so cool, this robot, or that robot, Hubo, so cool, but how can we make it better? You always have to have a desire to improve the technology and see, could we, could we make this even better? How can we creatively um, improve the capabilities? And so. Um, if you talk to doctors who use the robot or you watch them using it, they'll make comments like, I love how easy it is to see. There's actually a 3D camera so the doctor can see with two eyes and can see depth. And they love how dexterous the wrists are, how easy it is to move. But you can't feel anything. There's no touch feedback. So you can see what you're doing, but because there's no physical connection between the joysticks and the tools, you can't feel what you're doing. Well, does that matter? What do you think? Is it okay to not have a sense of touch? If you don't have a sense of touch, it means that everything you're normally doing with your fingers, the sensing part, has to be done with your eyes. And your eyes already have a lot to look at when you're doing surgery. There is quite a lot to pay attention to. So here's a really cool video from Professor Roland Johansson, who's a professor in Sweden. He's a scientist who studies the sense of touch. And he anesthetized or made numb the thumb, index finger, and middle finger of this woman and asked her to pick up a match and light it. That looks really hard, right? You could do this task very quickly yourself, uh, but when you have no sense of touch because they've been numbed, it becomes really, really difficult to manipulate objects and to light this match. It takes her almost 30 seconds when she has no sense of touch. She could do it in a second. Uh, or two with, that, with, a sense, with her sense of touch, and she can see. So this is kind of like what we're asking surgeons to do when they do surgery with a robot like the Da Vinci. We're asking them to do delicate manipulations, but with no sense of touch. And so I and many other researchers around the world had the idea, let's try to add some touch feedback into robots like this so the doctor can feel what they're touching. Scientists split your sense of touch into two main categories. The first is tactile sensations, things you feel in your skin, like temperatures and contacts. The second is kinesthetic, or things you feel inside your body, like the position and orientation of the parts of your body and how hard your muscles are working. And all of those are important every day. Um, but right now, it's impossible techno technologically. Give me 20 or 30 years, maybe I'll be able to do all of them. But right now, it's really, really challenging technically to add all of those kinds of touch feedback to a surgical robot controller like the one I showed you. And so instead, we had to make some good choices. And so um, we were trying to figure out, is there any blend or any type of haptic feedback that's possible, that's technically feasible, that as an engineer, I can create it, and a doctor would say, I want that. That'll help me operate better on my patients. Um, and so if you look at how the sense of touch works, there are four different kinds of cells in your fingertips that respond to different mechanical interactions. Uh, and they have different characteristics. But when you're doing surgery, you're not 
Sometimes you're touching the tissue directly, but a lot of times you're holding a tool and cutting or maneuvering inside the patient. And so it turns out there's a certain kind of sensor in your skin called a pachinian corpuscle. It's a vibration sensor. And these are actually the sensors that scientists know are most important when you're doing tasks with a tool, like writing with a pencil or sewing or doing surgery. And so we ended up focusing on these vibrations, which had never really before been studied as a potential avenue for adding haptic feedback in robotic surgery. So we've been focusing on vibrations, and we've had a lot of success with this. Um, here is the system that we created. This is actually what I've been demonstrating uh, on the table outside. You got to play with these if you came and visited me. And it's got several different components that we designed and built. We take all of them and attach them onto one of these surgical robots to give it haptic feedback so that the doctor can feel what they're touching. The first thing we add to the robot is a pair of sensors. These are little um, chips that have, they're called accelerometers. They measure vibrations and we, they cost about $10, which is cheap. That whole robot, think how much does it cost? More than a million dollars. So $10 is very, very cheap. So we can attach them onto the robot like this. That's one of the robot's arms. And we attach the sensor up where the tool attaches. And then the surgeon can say, oh, I want a pair of scissors. We'll go put the scissors in. And now when the tool touches things, the vibrations travel up the instrument and we can measure them with our sensor. On the other side, we have to play those vibrations for the surgeon to feel. So we designed custom actuators. They're called voice coil actuators. They're made a lot the same as a speaker in a stereo. They cost a couple hundred dollars, um, and we have to build all the parts around them to attach them to the joysticks that the surgeon uses. So that's where the, the surgeon puts his or her fingers through the white and black loops to control the motion of the tools. And so we just add um, this orange actuator module onto the joystick. And if I zoom in on how that actuator works, that silver part is a magnet. And the red part next to it is an electromagnetic coil. So when we send electricity through the coil, it pushes on the magnet. If we do that on and off, on and off, it shakes the coil, uh, or it shakes the magnet, and it lets the surgeon feel that the tool is touching something. And it happens constantly, like a microphone in a speaker, but for your fingers. So when we uh, put this all together, um, then when the doctor is holding the joysticks and moving the handles, the robot, follows those movements and lets them do, this is a practice task, um, but it, for practicing to do surgery, follows the motions, and when they hit stuff with the tools, the vibrations travel up and the surgeon can feel them. This is what you would see if you were the surgeon doing that practice task, and you're also gonna be able to hear the vibrations and see them plotted. So you can notice those little oscillations. Every time there's a collision, with the left tool and something, or between the two tools, we're able to measure these collision vibrations and graph them for you to see, play them for you to hear, and also let the surgeon feel so they know they hit something and they know how hard they hit it. All right, so to summarize, we invented, my lab at Penn invented new technology that enables the surgeon using this remote control robot uh, to feel what the instruments are touching during robotic surgery. And that was fantastic for the engineering side. It's technically feasible, it works, but that's not enough, right? So we can invent all sorts of new gadgets and widgets, um, but for them to really be viable, for it to become a product or something that could actually be used in a hospital, it has to also help the doctor. It can't just cost a little extra and um, be cool. It has to also help them deliver better care to their patients. And so we've done some more research on that question. The first question we had was, hey, will this work in real surgery? It works with little rubber blocks. So here's a video of the very first surgery uh, that we tested our technology in. And you can hear and see the vibrations. That's when the two tools hit each other. The surgeon is tying a knot with the purple string. And you can see we are able to measure really good vibrations here, cutting. Yeah, so this is deep inside a patient, and we're able, they're able to cut tissue, uh, and we tested, a, we did a whole bunch of recordings, uh, and we're able to show it works really well in live surgery. The, so yes, it worked, it would work in live surgery. The next question we had to answer is we had to talk to a lot of surgeons, 
You might know a doctor or a surgeon. They can have some strong opinions, and it's uh, important for them to know if they would want to use this. So we took our robot on a road trip. We took it down to a conference in Baltimore, and we set it up for three days at a conference where surgeons go, uh, and we had um, them each test it, or many, many people test it, with two different tasks, the PEG transfer task and the suturing task, um, and had them try it out. This is the distribution, 94 people and participated over the course of three days uh, uh, with a range of levels of training in medicine. And the first question we asked them was like, hey, do you think this should be on a robot like this? And we got 100% yes. That was really good results. That's about as good as you can imagine the results coming out. I was pretty happy. <laughs> Not a single person said, no, I don't like this. But it, but it makes sense because it lets you feel what you're doing, which is, feels more natural. Um, then we also said, hey, do you like it when you feel it in your hands or when you hear it with, in, with your ears like you guys are hearing? And overall, people really like the touch, the haptics, uh, and some people also like the hearing. But, so we found that overall people would really like to be able to feel what they're touching while they're doing surgery. Um, so that was a good second check. It worked work in real surgery and surgeons seem to like it. We also wanted to understand a little bit deeper, like these tool vibrations, what do they mean? So I've got a little quiz for you guys. This is a video of someone doing a surgery or doing this practice suturing task. And try to see, do you think this is a really expert surgeon, someone who's done a thousand surgeries on a patient, or someone who's new? You can kind of guess they're a little slow and a little awkward. And indeed, they're not an expert. They're a trainee, a novice, someone who's still learning. And we started realizing a lot of times they make a little bit wrong motions or they kind of hit things or are clumsy, like any of us would be when we're first learning to do surgery. And so we figured out that these motions or these vibrations that we can record actually tell us a lot about how well the doctor is doing the surgery. So we started using this um, in training to help doctors learn to do surgery faster um, and being able to check how, how they're doing on their learning process um, so that they can learn faster. The last, last thing I want to show you, um, so this has to do with manual school, the last thing I want to show you is another study we ran where we were trying to do that. We brought in new surgeons who were just learning how to do surgery with the robot and we tried to see how having touch feedback, would having touch feedback change how they do surgery? And so we brought them all in. There were 12 of them over the course of a year. Half of them learned to do surgery with the haptic feedback, and half of them learned without it, just the normal way. And they came over to our lab, and this is my lab in the grass lab, the robotics lab at Penn, and they used our Da Vinci, and they had to practice on fake organs, which we molded out of silicone, uh, and the surgery they learned to do was on the stomach. This is a fake stomach that we made, uh, and they have to learn to cut off part of the stomach to make the stomach smaller. This is a bariatric surgery where they're trying to reduce the stomach volume uh, for weight loss. But they had not done this surgery before, and they all learned, and half of them learned with the haptic feedback so they could feel when they would hit stuff and the other half couldn't feel. And then we looked at how well they did this surgery, both in simulation, so with those rubber organs, and also on real patients. And what we found was really striking, that when, during simulation when they're practicing on the rubber organs, the people who can feel what they're doing, they're the red group, the group that had haptics, they get higher skill rating scores. That's like a surgeon saying, hey, you're more ready to go do surgery on real patients. And the differences got even more striking when we followed them into the real operating room where they were operating on real patients. You can see the red group gets much higher skill ratings than the blue group. So we see that having some haptic feedback, be able to feel what your tools are touching while you're doing robotic surgery seems to help residents do much better surgery, which was really, really exciting. When I saw this, I almost started crying. I was really happy. <laughs> so we think it could be very useful for surgeons in training. Um, so after, this has been, we've been working on this for five years now. I think I've had many, many people help on this project and we're really delighted we were able to find a solution to an important problem uh, that's both technically feasible and could help surgeons. We're continuing to work on this. The next step, we're hoping to be able to do what's called a clinical trial where we test this technology on actual human patients who are coming to the hospital at Penn to have surgery, and some of them would be able to have surgery if they opted into the study um, when the surgeon has haptic feedback. And if the results from that came back good, then we would hope the company that makes the robot might license our patents 
and put it in the real robot in the future so that whenever anybody has robotic surgery in the future, the doctor would be able to feel what they're touching because it seems like it would help them deliver better care. Um, to sum up, these are all the surgeons I've worked with to do the research I showed you. These are the main three students, Ted, Will, and Carlin, who did the research. And there were a lot of other awesome students who've been helping me, undergrads, master's students, medical students at Penn. Uh, so they're the ones who did the real work I showed you. I want to thank our funding agencies who gave the grants that supported the work. Uh, and thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>